Hey, I just finished a great interview with Laura Toggs. Laura and her husband Pete are the youth pastors of Hillsong Sydney uh, Church, a great church. And they also head up a, a young people's movement globally called Young and Free. And uh, Laura also has a Secret Garden TV show, especially aimed at young mums, young women like herself. And we spoke about all of that and some of their joys, challenges, concerns, hopes for young people now and for the future. And uh, it was a great interview. She's a lovely human being. You're going to love this interview. Don't forget to subscribe to my podcast channel. Thank you. Before you get started on today's podcast with Paul Scanlon, we just wanted to let you know that he now has a free course available to you. If you head over to paulscanlon.com forward slash free course, you'll be able to sign up to his video series called The Five Behaviors of Successful People. We hope that this course adds value to your life. Now enjoy the podcast. How have you felt about the pandemic, Laura? I mean, um, I've come to decide three months in almost that perhaps it has it had some hidden blessings for us all that we didn't think at first. Do you think that? And what do you think some of those are? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, well, if I'm honest with you, for me, I have my health and... Um, so in that sense, I've been really blessed and mm. I've really enjoyed, <laughs> I've actually really enjoyed uh, being in isolation, surprisingly. And mm. um, I think for, for, for me, it's been like, I've realized that I don't need or want as much as I thought that I did. So okay. I thought, I think I, I had this idea of what I, what I love. Um, I had this idea that I love to be on the run. I love to be on the go. I love to kind of like be traveling and, you know, going from place to place and events and so on. Right. And I've realized that pulling that all back and not having that as even an option um, has shown me that I actually, I don't need that to find, um, I guess, fulfillment. Um, or even like the satisfaction of, of that. I think I've, I've been surprised at how much I've loved just simplifying the way that we live. Um, and that quality time with family, I've, I've just, I've loved that. Um, I think I've loved like, I've loved um, I'm going slower, but, but more intentional. And I've found that having having more time, but being intentional with my time, I've gained a whole lot more knowledge about even um, like like skills wise. Like I've I've realised that I've got more in me. Um, whereas before, I just didn't have the time to kind of explore like and try new things. So for me, like really simple, but like I've I've realised that I can cook, <laughs> <laughs> or at least there's potential there. There's potential. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that was something that I just, I just wrote off. I was like, no, I don't cook. I can't, but having, having more time and putting the, the thought into it, the, the effort into it, I realized that, yeah, that's a skill that I could, that, that I could develop. I've also started painting. Oh, yeah. So, what kind of painting? um, look, I'm no Picasso. But <laughs> well, but a lot of people think Picasso is crap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I think I don't know. It's just I I mean I don't know. I don't know how to really describe it. I've been doing like some I don't know. Yeah. Has that surprised you? The whole sort of um like I would you say an introvert, extrovert? Have you ever thought more about that before this? I think that I um I think before I was a mother, I was quite introverted. I was happy to be uh, like at home. Um, but then I think when I became a mother and I had people in little people in my personal space constantly, right. um, I something within me like something within me changed where I really enjoyed going out, socializing with adults, and that would re-energize me. So, yeah. So where does the painting in you come from? Have you done that before? Is that a new thing? I think I've, I've always been a creative um, oh. and I've always been curious if I could paint. I, I did art when I was younger in school, um, but 
I had never picked up a paintbrush in my adult life until um, probably, yeah, the beginning of the pandemic, actually. And it's interesting because um, because last year I was I was pregnant and I knew that I would be going into a new season having a baby. And one of the things I thought, oh, I would, you know, while I have a little bit of time off with the baby, I'm going to try and, and paint. Um, and so I already kind of had it within me, like that idea within me. But, um, but yeah, I think for me, I think creativity runs in our family. My mum is very, very creative in her, her own way. My dad is creative in his very unique way. Um, sure. I think, you know, all of us, we love music. We love um, visual arts. You know, we've got, I don't know, we've always, all of us have um, an appreciation for art. Um, and so I think it's, I think it probably comes from, from that. Yeah, from, from the family. What will you keep after the pandemic? What, what about this will you keep as opposed to, you know, people talk about going back to normal as if normal was great anyway, which it wasn't, we're all realizing, as you said, yeah. and the world, what are we in a rush to get back to kind of thing? So what would you, what do you think you'll keep out of the pandemic and the lockdown that you've discovered should now be a constant in your life kind of thing? Yeah. Um, I really practically speaking, I think, um, I think just, just kind of slowing and simplifying things down. Um, and like I said, just being really intentional with your, the, the days, like down to the, uh, down to the very moments of just under like for me, I've just, I've realized that even this, like this, this is my phone. Yeah, yeah. Even this, like, I feel like I'm even more aware of how much I am on screens as opposed to doing things with my hands. The one reason that I love painting is because I've got something in my hands and I am doing something that's not like, not engaging with a screen as such it's tangible um and the same thing with cooking i feel like it's like it's kind of practicing this like mindfulness um but it's but it's practical and it's tangible and um and so i hope that yeah i hope that 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 remains that i don't when things return i don't get so consumed with uh the hurry and the, and the busy and so on that um that yeah i just lose sight of the value of yeah of i don't know yeah doing some of those like practical creative things i think do you think you've been happier in the lockdown to use that word have these things made you do you think a happier person yeah i do i think i have i think i have had a deeper level of contentment uh, cool. than i have in in many years um and you know, for me to wake up in our, our suburban home and to walk to the coffee shop and, you know, pa pass by people in our neighborhood who are also on their daily walk. Right. And uh, those little things like have been really sweet. And, um, and I think for me, because like I have family who are now living across the other side of the world right. and, you know, I have people who are here and there and so on. There, there was a, a good uh, portion of the last few years where I was, my mind and my heart was somewhere else, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas, whereas I think for me, I'm like, oh, I actually feel like I, I'm where I'm supposed to be and I'm happy. I'm happy where, where I'm at. And um, that's a huge win for me personally, that I'm, I'm finding that deep sense of contentment where I am. I've noticed people posting throughout the pandemic and the lockdown about noticing much more the birds or nature or mm. the weather or the environment around them, you know, as if it just suddenly appeared rather yeah. than that, that was always there. Maybe you just yeah. slowed down long enough to realize it was always there. You were tuned out to it. That's got to be a great thing for our humanity and simplifying our life, don't you think? Yeah. And, you know, you think like, I mean, we know that, you know, things like mental illness and so on right. is such a big thing for people of all ages, wherever, you know, they may be uh, right across, right across the breadth of humanity. It's, it's a huge thing. And so I think, 
you know, my mum put it this way. Um, it's, it's as if we've all gone to our bedrooms, you know, like when you're a child and like there's siblings and they're in contention and your mum right. you know, sends them to their room to sort themselves out. It's like yeah. we've all been sent into our, into our homes just to sort ourselves out a little bit. Um, yes. and I, I, for me, I'm, I relate to that because I think, you know, I think it's been a really rewarding experience of, um, yeah, like I said, just understanding what's important, um, dealing with some of the things that we have, but, but in the process, it's like creating this mind, mindfulness that um, is actually very good. It's very healing and it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's very like a, a practical way to deal with things like anxiety or, or whatever else you might be dealing with. So I think loneliness, anxiety, depression, et cetera, is, is huge at this time amongst young people as well. I know you guys work a lot amongst young people and talk to you, talk to you about that in a minute. But yeah. is it something you feel has come on the radar more in the lockdown? Have you had more people reaching out for that? Has it become a bigger thing for you to address? Yeah, I think, you know, like I have, I felt really sorry for some of my friends who were around my age who were single. And I know they went into this year, you know, hoping to meet new people and, um, and, in a like in a in a way that's been postponed you know like there's been like many things yeah. that we can think about like you know events being postponed or cancelled or whatever but for many people they just felt like oh even their hopes and their dreams or their desires for this right. year at a personal level um you know and so i feel for those people and i and i know as well like i'm blessed because i live in a quite spacious environment um yeah. And I have my family and so on. And, you know, I can go down for a walk on the street and I pass by a friend who lives down the road. And so there is that element of connection, whereas a lot of people don't have that. And so I, I know that there are a lot of young people, a lot of people in general who have been doing it really tough. Um, and my heart goes out to them, you know, but um, I have a feeling that we're going to come out of this pandemic and we are going to, feel like it was all a dream like it already does feel a little bit like that like a bit of a blur um, and so i i believe that it's not going to be wasted um for, for people that uh we would have learned many things and if anything we're going to come into this next season of life uh whatever that looks like um with a greater sense of um intentionality and um purpose yeah. I've been teaching about the prosperity of the soul for quite a while now around the world. And when I met you guys at Youth America, I was speaking to the young people there about um, the soul. Yeah. Out of this awareness that um, I think the emerging generation, as you know, you guys are with them all the time, are not looking um, to live anymore from the outside in, but to yeah. live from the inside out. They're much more aware than my generation were of the need to look after yourself internally. And I wonder if the lockdown is making them aware of that more, that happiness actually is much closer to you than you thought it was. As you said, mm -hmm. it doesn't require as many things or people or travel or opportunities as you thought it would require. I wonder if it will have a good effect on the emerging generation, especially with you guys working with so many young people, that they will come to see things we've been trying to tell them for decades that <laughs> as you get older, you figure out what matters yeah. is not what you thought that mattered. And maybe a pandemic will accelerate that understanding amongst young people, you think? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's funny because I saw a meme uh, yesterday that said, in a matter of this generation, in a matter of days, went from making banana bread to eradicating racism. <laughs> 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 and I thought, oh yeah, that, like if that kind of puts my generation into perspective I think that you know up until now we live we live in the digital age and for us we have as a generation we've got challenges that we're figuring out um and I think we are masters of putting on facades creating yes. an image creating an image projecting that image online um but I think if anything that that's that has got exhausted and people are, and young people, especially, I think they are just so hungry for what's real. 
-hmm. and um and also i guess not projecting but like giving that i I mean living with this with a sense of um of encouraging that in others of being of being real um and and not kind of like projecting this this false image of yourself um and understanding that it do, it does start from within and you know for for me like i am um, you know I, you know one of the things that i do is uh the secret the secret garden um, yes. which specifically for girls um but i was the, 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 how that came about was I felt like I wanted to do something online. I wanted to do some sort of blog. I was interested in fashion. I was interested in interior design and beauty and all those sorts of things. But I looked and I thought, well, that's being done. Like that's like almost oversaturated. And I just didn't know if that was, that was my lane. And, and as I began to kind of think about what I was supposed to do, I really felt like, well, you know what, um, it's all good. Like if you're creating this appearance and um, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you are going home at the end of the day and put laying your head on the pillow and you are empty or like, there's no, there's, you're tending to, you're not tending to what's within and right. all your energy is on what's external, but not on what's internal, then, you know, that's, a, that is a sad, sad reality for people right. and for right. young women. And so, um, and so I really felt like that was, that was a God thing for this generation, um, is like inside first, mm. that's where it starts. Like you said, it's the pro- pro- prosperity of our soul, um, and our heart and tending to what's within. Um, we have, we have to start there because, um, these are interesting days that we're, we're living in and that this generation is a part of and, um, yeah. And I think the stillness. Within. I think the stillness we talked about, getting still long enough for that part of your humanity to connect with you that moves you into painting or moves you into some other interest that you didn't know was in you. I wonder if out of this pandemic will come a lot of entrepreneurial ideas, a lot of new businesses, a lot of new initiatives in the church because we've all got still long enough to connect with a part of us that is normally crowded out by all the yeah. business and all the noise. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, I was going to ask you to, uh, sorry, Laura. I was going to mm-hmm. ask you to about, um, you know, the racism thing that's mm-hmm. going on in the world. What has been your feeling towards all of that? What has been your um, thinking about it? You know, a couple of weeks on, of course, from George Floyd's death. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we're, I feel like we are in the thick of it at the moment as pastors, as friends and peers. Yeah. Um, so for me, initially, it was, you know, I saw I saw the video of George right. Floyd and it was just heartbreak. It was just feeling that sense of just helplessness and hopelessness for this, for this man. Um, and... And then it quickly moved. Oh, actually, I took a couple of days, but it, it moved into this space where I realized that this has opened up a deep wound for people. Yeah. Um, and it's not just this thing that's going on in the USA, but mm. we are a part of a really beautiful, diverse community. We have um, a large African community within our church. We have... Yeah. Uh, people of color and, um, you know, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in Australia. Mm. And, um, and, and we, I've, you know, realized within the last few days that people are really, really hurting. They're in pain over, over this situation and what it has um, exposed this, this wound that has been there for a long time, for hundreds of years, generations. Um, But it has just, uh, I guess I feel I, I really am, I don't understand. And I'm admitting that I may never understand because I am a white woman, but, um, but I am, my eyes are being open and I feel like there's an, an awakening happening across the earth where we realize that this is, this is a huge thing. This is a huge thing on, on the radar for the, for the earth and for humanity. And, um, and I think we're, we're half, 
we're having to we're being forced to wake up and pay attention um and lend an listening ear for peter and i the last um the last week has been just not speaking too much just having conversations and just listening um, to people in their pain and understanding the reality that they live with um daily so yeah is it something you guys have spoken about in the past quite a bit to young people, the whole racism thing, especially with you and Peter um, being mixed race or whatever the right terms are yeah. these days. But have you felt because of that, that you guys are standing in front of these young people um, and you therefore perhaps are able to have a voice to them about that? Um, obviously it's very raised in our consciousness now, but has mm -hmm. it been a thing you felt has come up a lot in the past with young people or you've intentionally raised it or, or what? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's, there was a, um, an, an, a knowledge of it as yeah. such, but um, even for Peter, Peter's Fijian, he migrated to Australia when he was uh, one, yeah. one year old, and um, with his family. I met him when I was as young as six. Um, you know, he's grown up in our church, yeah. and, um, and I never thought, I've, I've just, it never crossed my mind uh, to yeah. ask him if he ever had dealt with racism right, or felt right. racism until this past week, I asked him. I said, "Pete, have you ever have you ever experienced racism?" And he shared stories with me from his childhood wow. that were actually extremely traumatizing, and I just had I had no idea. Right. Um, and that's something that you know I'm not I'm not going to feel guilty about that because that's not productive. But um, but. For him, I think he's like, well, on one hand, he has, he's felt like Australia has been wonderful to him and our church has been inclusive. And he, you know, he, we mentioned it, we recorded a conversation for our Sunday service and he was saying how, you know, he was this week in a board meeting and like, you know, and so in, on one hand, he's just felt like he's had incredible opportunities and, yeah. and so on. But, but there is also this reality um, where he has, uh, he has felt um, real prejudice towards him. Um, and, and so f I think for us, you know, like, even if I think about, um, you know, if I am to mention uh, our history as a nation, um, you know, it, it, we, it's all good for us to, to go, well, we're standing alongside, you know, right. our American brothers and sisters. Um, but in reality, our, we have a really dark history ourselves. Sure. Um, and so, um, and so we have to acknowledge that and, um, you know, I just, I, I truly believe that this is an awakening and that this is really close to the father's heart. Um, this is, this is close to God's heart and, um, as Christians yeah. and, and the church, um, I don't think that we have the choice. I think that we have to step in, into this space and move into action here. I think, yeah. I think one of the big weaknesses of the church historically and still around the world has been our inability to be in other people's shoes that are different to us. You know, 98% of our country and Europe are not in church and are quite anti-church because I think generationally we have not empathized enough with people different to us and our approach to them has been with our agenda to teach yeah. and to convert and evangelize rather than to listen and to learn. So yeah. I think that this awareness that's in the world now is a great opportunity for us to listen and learn. I was talking to, I was talking to a black guy uh, a while back and it's things like, and this is a, a lot of this is on social media now, as you know, like the stories Peter's told you, that you just can't believe because we are white and privileged and don't see it. So this guy yeah. said to me, when he gets in, when he gets in the elevator as a black guy, he always presses the button straight away so that others don't think he's in there lingering to perhaps commit yeah. a crime. Yeah. And I heard Bishop Jake speaking the other day on an interview with Carl Lentz that mm. uh, when his um, son had a, a car crash and the cops were called, that uh, Bishop Jake said his main thing was to keep his son, he said, keep me on the phone, keep the phone in your hand, keep me on the phone, 
when the cops arrived, keep me on the phone because he was terrified that his son would get in trouble with white cops. That's the yeah. main concern. The car was fine. There were other things that should have mattered more. And as a yeah. white person, we wouldn't have been aware of a need to keep our kids on the phone. That's it, yeah. The biggest yeah. danger was the cops, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. It, well, it's not funny, but like, you know, just hearing stories about even people on our own staff who are my colleagues and, you know, um, and you know they tell they have just shared stories about every time they go into a grocery store they make sure that they print out a right. receipt just to just to make sure that they're not going to be stopped or wow. you know like same sort of thing like being uh you know like if they walk into an elevator and they see a, somebody else walk out and it's it's those things that you know like i i just that's not my experience and so sure you know, it's, you're right. Like this is a, this is a moment where we, I have been, you know, I think if, if there's been one message that I have been, that, that I have been preaching for the last couple of years, at least it's, it is empathy. And here I am in a position where it's like, okay, now, now it's time that we put our, we put ourselves in other people's shoes and we truly take that time to seek to understand and, and to listen. I remember being in South Africa a while back, uh, when I was asking black people to help me understand this race thing from their perspective. And a guy said to me, um, what color are band-aids? And I said to him, well, they're flesh colored. And he said, what flesh colored? And I said, oh, hmm, a good point. They're Caucasian. And he said, mm -hmm. it's especially ridiculous in South Africa with 60 million population, 40 million of whom are black, and there's no band-aids of their skin color. Then he began to ask me how many black dollies are there or toys for kids to play with, how many, yeah. how many black superheroes and so on and so on. Uh, what kind of shampoo, uh, what kind of, whose, whose hair is the shampoo for in hotels? Mm. I didn't even know black people needed a different shampoo for their hair. It's yeah. that. And when you, when you sit and listen to that, you think, wow, it is a white world in more ways mm -hmm. than I ever realized. So I committed, you know, 20 years ago because our, our church was predominantly white middle class and we weren't reaching other people in our city that were different to us. We were praying and singing about them, but we weren't reaching them. Right. And when I began to reach into the worst parts of our city, I determined then that I must educate myself on what it's like to be um, an outsider, to be socioeconomically excluded or skin color or gender or lifestyle. Um, and I think the church has been very poor at that. I'm hopeful that out of this pandemic and also the racism consciousness now will come out of it with, with a better result for the church around the world. And I think, as you said a moment ago, the intentionality is a massive word right now. If you're not intentional about this and stay intentional after the awareness fades, because it will, I think we'll lose a massive opportunity. Totally. Laura, yeah. tell us... Tell us a little bit about what you do and try and explain it to me like I'm a stranger. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what I do? Yes. Okay. Um, so, well, um, I work for my church. Yes. Hillsong Church. Yes. And my what husband you, and I, uh, yep. What do you huh? do for the church? What's your role for I'm, the church? So we, with along with my husband, we are our youth pastors here in Australia, but also globally. Um, we lead Young and Free, which I say is our uh, global youth expression of right. our church. Um, and so for me, that includes uh, given, giving creative direction, um, vision, um, like prophetic vision, um, but also uh, leading our team, um, even uh, making decisions, uh, key decisions on uh, our music um, and uh, I guess delivering that. Um, and then uh, we, I also, uh, I initiated a, a online um, platform called The Secret Garden TV, which is uh, targeted towards young women. Um, and then just uh, involved in our week-to-week -week church services um, from sisterhood to, um, you know, involved in our, our college uh, and then also our church services. So how have you guys managed, you know, when, when, you, when people work together and live together, there's very little separation between those two worlds. <laughs> so how have you guys managed to 
um, have different identities, as it were, different spaces, yeah. because your work life is your home life and your home life is your work life kind of thing. Because I think a lot of people have not done that well over the years and still are not. How have you guys managed to balance that? I think when when Peter and I became, uh, became the youth pastors, um, my dad actually, he said, make sure that you guys do different things. So figure out what you want to do and, and figure out where your strengths are and, uh, and take ownership um, take ownership there and create those clear roles and those clear differences and make that really clear as well for your team. And so we did that uh, from, from, from early on, like Peter is very pastoral. He loves young people. He's, uh, he's a great leader. He loves, he loves speaking into leadership. Um, and, uh, and so for him, he took on our day to day, week to week runnings of our youth. Um, our, <coughs> from leading our youth pastors, age group pastors, right across Australia and, and being there as a support for our youth pastors on a global level as well at our, at our global campuses. Um, and, and for me, I know like I'm creative. Um, I, you know, I, I like to think if I can say about myself that I am visionary, um, you know, ideation is, is probably my number one strength. And so I love ideas and I love, um, seeing a gap and seeing a need need in in the world like in society and and creating uh things to that end um and so for me young and free was pioneered out of that out of uh, it didn't exist but um but i saw a gap and i saw a need yeah. i knew my strengths i knew my giftings and i i knew that i could do that so what do you love about what you do in terms of the youth pastoring and leading what do you love about that and what don't you like about it? <clears throat> I love, um, well, firstly, I love young people and, yeah. um, and that's, that's number one. I think if I was in it to give myself a platform or, you know, like if it was to bring that sense of like self-fulfillment, then I've got it all wrong and, and I know that I wouldn't be effective. And so oh, for me, yeah. it, has to, it has to be about young people. It has to be about um, serving them first and foremost um and you know i'm getting older and i've been in it for a while now and so it's interesting whenever i feel like you know i'm disengaging uh within my heart i i pray about it and like god break my heart break my heart for young people again and and mm. and every time every time i'll hear a story or i'll have some sort of encounter where i'm reminded why i do what i do and so yeah. that's number one um and then, sorry, what was the question? I've forgotten. The fr I think the frustrations of working with young people. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. What are some of the frustrations yeah. in your role towards young people? Um, <coughs> frustrations. I think there is like, kind of like, there is a, even for me, like, I think I would be classed as being a, a millennial, but on the older, like on the older side of a millennial. Yeah. And I find yeah. that there's even differences between, how old I am and, and where I am and how I see things and you know how I have uh, lived my life and functioned and even people just a couple of years few years younger than I am there's there's a bit yeah. of a divide there um, right. and and so for me like you know I often find myself going well don't you know what working hard is like <laughs> don't you right. like think like I just I think I get I get frustrated at um, just that difference. But then at the same time, like I also learn so much from young people and I think who are younger than I am. And I think that they are brilliant. They have so much to teach me and people who are older and who have been in the church for a long time. And so, um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't, to be honest, like not much frustrates me about young people. I think they're pretty amazing. What are some of the major challenges that you feel young people are dealing with right now? Is, is there something that, you know, despite nationality or race or gender that you feel are common issues and challenges? Is there a top three or four things that you guys are always feeling you need to be talking to them about? Um, I think, yeah, I think stress is a huge thing for young people. 
um, especially when it comes to their study, uh, when it comes to uh, them finding what they want to do, what they're, I'm sorry, my kids are, go leave. <laughs> <I think. laughs> um, yeah, so, um, yeah, that, that's been a huge thing. And I think especially during this, this pandemic, my heart has gone out for people who are doing their final year or who are just beginning school and so on because it's like that stress has been accelerated, like uh, heightened. heightened. Um, stress is a big thing. Mental illness is, is a huge thing. Um, so anxiety, depression. Um, and then I think as well, just, um, yeah, I think, I think that young people, they work in ways that are unconventional. Um, and, but it's, so it's kind of like making that work in a world that is, is changing. <laughs> yes. If that makes yeah. sense. Which I know I'm, that's something that, um, that I've heard you speak about, but so many, well, I guess for generations, people have been out of the box as such, but we're living in this time where, uh, I think young people are rising up and kind of proving that you don't have to fit into a box, but it, there's just still this like element of like proving themselves in that, um, that I think can be quite stressful. I think part of the stress for young people, don't you think, is that um, the education system seems to lead them to believe that, and the parents often are part of the problem in making them have to get certain qualifications and certain results. And, and what my generation knew is that that was put on us strongly. But my kids and my grandkids, it's a whole new world, is that intelligence is a much broader definition now than it was when I was at school, that intelligence is multifaceted. But my generation was, you know, left brain logic. It wasn't at all celebrating right brain creativity. I think the kids neurologically are wired differently to my generation. Um, and the celebrating of that you you can make a living, you can have a life um, built around what God made you good at, which yeah. doesn't need to be a academics kind of thing. I think that message still needs to be loud and clear to kids that you can make a living out of your art or your creativity or your particular form of intelligence and brilliance. But the education system doesn't celebrate lots of that because it's not on the school curriculum, right? That's it. Yeah. You know, I personally, like I remember when I was uh, as young as kindergarten uh, and not understanding, just not comprehending what was going on in the classroom. And from that moment on, I believed that I wasn't smart. And my whole, whole school experience, that was the foundation. That's, that was my core belief within myself that I wasn't intelligent. And it wasn't until I finished school and mm -hmm. I found myself uh, in the workplace and someone that I realized, well, I, I am intelligent. It just, it just looks differently. Um, and yes. so I, I am a huge advocate for, for that. Yeah. And when you talk about depression and anxiety amongst young people, what is that normally linked to? Cause my generation would think, well, what have you got to be depressed about in terms of the quality of life these days that the emerging generation have? compared to we baby boomers, and that comes back to that work ethic thing, we work for everything. And many say that the millennial generation have this entitlement thing, which our generation didn't have, kind of thing. Yeah. So where do you, what do they tell you the depression is linked to? Is that a common thread? I mean, I think, I think time will tell. Um, I, I think that we are learning about the world that we're living and being a part of the digital age. Um, yeah. You know, there's the obvious things that we are all aware of. Yeah. Um, and so there's the, you know, my, my daughter, she has a, um, we have a family phone. So she doesn't have a phone, but she, we have a family phone and she had access to it on the weekend. Mm -hmm. And so she has, she has TikTok, um, which, you know, I, I keep very close to and uh, monitor it for her. Yeah. But she came in, she came in crying. She's nine years old. She came in crying because she realized all of her friends were hanging out without, without her. And right. I was like, I was like, you're nine, like you're nine, like you, you're not old enough to have a phone yet. And to, yes. to be exposed to this reality that we live with. Um, 
you know, when I was nine, I didn't, I would, I didn't know that, you know, if my friends were hanging out without me, I wouldn't have oh. a clue. Um, yeah. And so there are things that I think that um, play into uh, insecurities, into yes. things that are happening here that perhaps were seeded when we were young and now it's right in front of us. And there's also, you know, it's changing, but for, for years there was a, an actual numeric, measure of value um on our social media and so yep. if you know obviously like you know i pop you know i used to think about am i popular or am i like not as popular as my best friend or so on right. And, right. and now you hop on instagram and it literally tells you if you have if you're more popular than than another person right. Right. or right. if your content's getting more likes than another person and all those things I think play into insecurities. Some people care about that. Other people, they couldn't care less, um, mm -hmm. and it and it looks differently for them. But I just think that this day and age that we're living in, where we are just, we it's just in front of our face. You know, it's just right there. Um, you know, that's it's uh, it's a, it's a lot. And I just also think it's like we're, what we're talking about. I think like just being on the go and. Um, you know, um, being exposed to so much content and so much media and so many right. things um, and forgetting to breathe and forgetting about this beautiful world around us. And, yeah. um, you know, all those things, I think, definitely have a part to play. Um, yeah, yeah. What do you do, Laura, yourself now to... Uh, develop internally are you a reader are you a listener um uh do you journal um what are your personal some of your personal development things that are go-to's behaviors and habits for you that you kind of feel are non-negotiables for you in your life um oh well, that's a good question i think <laughs> i think i'm on a journey of figuring that out yeah like again um i think in the past i, I have loved to journal, um, I read, but not necessarily like books, <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm always reading um, articles and uh, content and the news and, and so on. Um, and I, I do listen, I am a listener. And so I, I do kind of like to engage in, um, whether it's um, conversation through podcasts or, or whatever. Uh, so I'm interested in all of those things, but I think, I think I, I'm still learning how, what really works for me. And um, I feel a little bit exhausted by all the talking, to be honest, and sure. all the opinions and all yeah, the yeah. things. Um, and so, I, and like we, we were just saying, like, I think that, that the pandemic has been good for me just to kind of switch off and disconnect a little bit and feel more, I mean, it, it sounds a little bit cliche, but just feel more connected uh, to what's present. Any big discoveries in the last, do you feel, if that's the right word, um, mm -hmm. aha moments about something, about yourself or about God or about the church or about humans? Some big, <laughs> anything you thought, you know, this, yeah, when I journaled that six months ago, that's kept coming back in my mind on a repeat loop. My awareness is taken by that issue or that concern um that can be to that could be to do with your own breakthrough in your own development a framing of yeah. something a new belief or habit that you've stepped into with regard to personal health or development yeah. or habits of yeah. life that have bec that you think now will stay with you for life kind of thing yeah i think i think there is uh for me i i feel like i have got to a point where i have become really self-aware and i know what have been the pitfalls for me in, in in the past um and so certain things that have maybe uh tr triggered um things that like a um a frag like fragile for for me i'm more aware of those things now um which is really, it, I guess, a sense, uh, a feeling of like just maturing and uh, and growing past things, um, and not being stuck, not being stuck in old ways of, of thinking and feeling. But um, you know, I kind of 
the way that I kind of explain it is um, when my children throw tantrums, uh, they I, I I kind of get down on their level and I'm like, you can't you can't do that anymore. You're you're growing up, like you're you're getting older now, like this, right. like what you're doing. You can't do that that anymore. And I kind of I feel like that for myself. Like when I start going down old ways of thinking or checking little tantrums to God or whoever, to my husband or whatever it may be. I kind of, I feel, I hear my own voice. Like you can't, you can't do that anymore. Like we, we've got to grow past this. We've got right. to get past this. Um, which, which does, you know, feel like a little bit of a, a maturing um, in that sense. Um, and oh, where was I going with that? I think. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in personal routines that you feel have become non-negotiable yeah. because clearly. I, you know, even just a, a few years ago, I decided, you know, I decided that I wanted to feel the best that I possibly could. Um, yeah. And, um, and so I had to make decisions about how that how I was going to live my life, what I was going to prioritize, what I was going to eat, like, uh, all of those sorts of things. And, and honestly, that changed my life. It changed oh. my life when I decided to prioritize being my, my best self. Um, um, and, um, yeah, that, that's been very rewarding for me. So they're non-negotiables now for life for you. Some of the personal disciplines, like, is there such a thing as a typical day for you? Uh, <laughs> not usually. I think like sometimes I can, uh, at the moment, at the moment, we've kind of found ourselves in a little bit of a rhythm. Um, it looks different than it did a couple of weeks ago, but I think we're starting to kind of be like, okay, on Thursdays, we, on Mondays, we plan our youth program for Friday nights. On Tuesday, we have, a, you know, a certain meeting. On Thursday, we're recording for church. On Friday, we're recording for youth. On Sunday, we're watching church now. Um, and so, and my kids are back at school. And so there is a little bit more of a routine um, but I, this kid, honestly, go to sleep, he's run away now. Um, <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, in when before, before COVID, my life was, um, it looked very different because it felt like it was, it was like just going from like event to event and yeah. it's not yeah. a normal way of, living it's uh you know i think just even just being on a, on a platform in front of you know people all the time and uh in green rooms and so on like that that was my normal um and do you miss that i don't at the moment i think i yeah. i think i will but i don't at the moment at all do you miss traveling <laughs> I love traveling. I really do. Um, I'm not missing it right now, but I think, I think I will. I think I will get to the point where I, my parents, my parents actually went to the USA. They got special clearance, clearance to go. And the day that they left, I said to Pete, I am so glad that I'm not getting on a plane and heading to the USA right now. Like I, I'm right. just happy to be here. Um, but I think I will get to the point where um where I where I want to travel again, um, yeah. But oh, but what I was saying was like in the midst of that abnormal kind of lifestyle, I have had to work out how to uh, create rhythms and um and work in disciplines because you know you've always got an excuse for like oh well I don't need to prioritize my fitness because we're at a conference or I can eat bad right. because it there's always some reason like uh you know like it's yeah so you have to kind of find those disciplines in the midst of an abnormal way of living are you a are you a, a goal setting person and if so do you guys talk about we want to be here in five years time or we don't want to be doing this in five years time or we want to do yeah. less of this and what do some of those look like? Uh, I, you know, Peter and I are definitely having conversations about what our lives could look like in the future. There is, yeah. there is most certainly a sense of unknown at the moment. Um, and 
and I think for a long time we've been okay with that, but I do feel like there is this, uh, like this kind of thing within us that that is kind of wanting to know what's next for us. Yeah. Um, I think for us as well, you know, we're, we're young, but we're not like, we're not super young, you know, we're both in our thirties now and, um, and we've both been in youth since we were 12 years old. And so, <laughs> and so in, on one hand, we, we love what we do and we, we don't want to do something, anything else. But then on the other hand, we know that we are also growing older. And so, um, and so we do have, uh, no, I have, I feel like I have long-term vision and, and short-term goals. That's right. kind of how I live my life. And so um, I try to kind of be open, be open to what the future, future looks like, but then be very intentional about the immediate future at the same time. How can um, the listeners find you guys, find what you do, Laura? Tell me a little bit about how people can track with you. Um, so, uh, for me with the girls, it's the secret garden TV. Um, I am uploading content on that. Um, we are wait, right now we have youth programs that are available and we're encouraging youth ministries right across the globe. Perhaps they're not able to, um, gather physically, but also don't have the resources to create content. Um, and so they're welcome to join us and that's, uh, hillsongyouth.com uh, for uh, young and free with our music and so on uh, that's available on all all music platforms um, and we have an album that's that's due to come out in the next right. month which is really exciting right. um, and so yeah and then there's our, our social media as well and where can people find and buy your artwork <laughs> I'm actually I'm just practicing at this point but I, I have had a few people ask, and so we'll see. Yeah, you could, have a, you could have a gallery opening, perhaps even before COVID is over, at the back end of the year, a social distancing viewing of your artwork, or a remote <laughs> one online. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Listen, I want to thank you for your time, Laura, seriously, and your attention. You know, I love you guys to bitch, you and your family and uh, celebrate all that you guys are doing. It was lovely to bump into you in Oklahoma yeah. uh, a couple of years ago. I'm sending love to you and to Pete and your family. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. I think our listeners are going to love this interview. I have. Great. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. Thank you for taking the time to listen to Paul Scanlon's podcast channel. We just wanted to remind you about the free course that's available to you on the five behaviors of successful people. So go and head over to paulscanlon.com forward slash free course to sign up for that today. And please do subscribe, share and review this podcast channel.